Why did Spain authorize Columbus's expedition in search of a westward route to the Indies? When Christopher Columbus, born Cristoforo Colombo, 1451-1506, who was Italian, became convinced that Earth was round. He had been studying the writings of Ptolemy, and that he could, therefore, reach the east by traveling due west across the ocean, he first took the idea to the King of Portugal to seek his financial aid. This was about 1483. The move was a natural one, he had settled in Portugal at the age of 25, married a Portuguese woman. Who bore him one son before she died. And Portugal was the leading seafaring nation of Europe at that time, carrying out southbound voyages with the intent of rounding. Africa and reaching the Indies to the east. But Columbus was rebuffed by the Portuguese monarch. When in 1484 he took his plan to the Spanish monarchs, King Ferdinand. 1452-1516, and Queen Isabella, 1451-1504, they too refused to back him. But Columbus persisted, and in 1492 the Spanish king and queen agreed to sponsor the explorer's plan. There were two reasons for the decision, the overland trade route to the Indies. India and its adjacent lands and islands in the Far East, had long been cut off by the Turks. And the Western Europeans found themselves in need of finding a new trade route to the Far East. Further, Ferdinand and Isabella were devout Christians. As was Columbus, and they all shared a desire to advance the Christian religion. In short, the monarchs saw that there were both material and religious advantages for backing Columbus's expedition. How was Rome sacked? After the split of the Roman Empire in 395, the West Roman Empire continued to weaken and Rome became subject to a series of brutal attacks by Germanic tribes. In 410 the Visigoths moved into Italy and looted Rome, in 455 the Vandals thoroughly ravaged the city. Finally, in 476 the city fell when the Germanic chieftain Odoacer. 433-493, forced Romulus Augustulus, c450- the last ruler of the empire, from the throne. By this time, however, Germanic chiefs had already begun claiming Roman lands and dividing them into several smaller kingdoms. The year 476 marks the official collapse of the West Roman Empire. Who was the first person to reach the North Pole? There has been some dispute over this one. The credit usually goes to American explorer and former naval officer Robert E. Peary, 1856-1920, who, after several tries, reached the North Pole by dog sled on April 6, 1909, along with Matthew A. Henson and three Inuit companions. Unbeknownst to him. Five days before this achievement, 
another American explorer, Dr. Frederick Cook, 1865-1940, claimed that he had reached the North Pole a year earlier. Perry and Cook knew each other. Cook had been the surgeon on the Peary Arctic Expedition of 1891 to 1892, which reached Greenland. And for his part, Cook's claim was investigated by scientists. But the evidence he supplied did not substantiate the claim. Thus, Peary was recognized as the first to reach the northern extremity of Earth's axis. When were the major waves of immigration to the United States? The first wave of immigration was during colonial times. When most new arrivals to North America were from England. But other European countries were represented as well, including France. Germany, Ireland, Italy, the Netherlands, Sweden, and Wales. By 1700 roughly a quarter million people lived in the American colonies. By the beginning of the American Revolution, 1775 to 83. The number had climbed to 700,000. Some of these new arrivals had been encouraged to immigrate by Virginia's head right system. Englishmen who could pay their own Atlantic crossing were granted 50 acres of land. Each of their sons and servants were also granted an additional 50 acres. Other colonies also adopted the head right system, with the land amounts varying in each. Other immigrants in this first wave were poor and could not afford the price of the transatlantic passage. By signing a contract agreeing to work as an indentured servant for a period of typically three to seven years, their fare was paid by their future master. At the end of this period, the servant became a freeman and was usually granted land tools, or money by the former master. During the American Revolution and for several decades after, the flow of immigrants into the new country slowed. A second wave of immigration began in 1820. During the next 50 years, nearly 7.5 million newcomers arrived in the United States. Many were Irish who escaped the effects of the Great Famine back home. Settling the cities along the eastern U.S. seaboard. An equal number, roughly a third, were German. Who settled the nation's interior farmlands, particularly the Midwest. An economic. Depression in the 1870s stemmed the tide of immigrants, but only for a short time. Between 1881 and 1920 a third wave brought more than 23 million immigrants to American shores. These new arrivals were largely from Eastern and Southern Europe. German immigration reached its peak in 1882. In 1883 the United States saw the peak of immigration from Denmark. Norway, Sweden, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and China. Just after the turn of the century, in 1902, U.S. immigration set new records as people from Italy. Austro-Hungary, and Russia made the transatlantic journey. Between 1920 and 1965 immigration slowed. 
in the last three and a half decades of the 20th century and into the 21st. A fourth wave of immigration has taken place. In spring 1998 the U.S. Census Bureau released a report citing that 9.6% of American residents are foreign-born, or roughly one in every ten. This is the highest percentage reported since the 1930s, when 11.6% of U.S. residents were natives of another country a result of the third wave of immigration, 1881-1920. However, the origin countries have shifted, Latin Americans now account for about half of all new arrivals. One-fourth are Asian-born and one-fifth are European. If the Roman Empire was so powerful, how could it have fallen? One could argue that the Roman Empire collapsed under its own weight. It had become too vast to be effectively controlled by any one ruler. By the close of the Punic Wars in 146 BC, Greece, Macedonia, and the Mediterranean coasts of Spain and Africa had been brought under Roman control. Within a century, Rome again began to expand overseas. Under the Roman general Pompey, 106 to 48 BC, Eastern Asia Minor, Syria, and Judea, Palestine, were conquered. Next, Gaul was conquered by Pompey's rival, Julius Caesar, 100 to 44 BC. Adding the territory west of Europe's Rhine River to the Roman world. In 31 BC, in the Battle of Actium, Octavian. 63b.ca.d.14, Julius Caesar's adopted son and heir, defeated the forces of Mark Antony, c. 83 to 30 BC. And Cleopatra, 69 to 30 BC, Queen of Egypt, and in 30 BC Egypt became a Roman province. In 27 BC Octavian became the first Roman emperor and was known as Augustus, meaning exalted. Though Octavian's rule marked the beginning of the long period of stability called the Pax Romana. The Roman Empire had become so large stretching across Europe and parts of Africa and the Middle East that only a strong, central authority could govern it. During the 200 years of the Pax Romana, Rome's emperors gradually grew more powerful. To the point that after death an emperor was worshipped by the people. But soon there were threats to this central control, not the least of which was the spread of Christianity. As well as invasions from the Germanic Goths and the Persians. Theodosius I, 379-395, was the last emperor to rule the entire Roman Empire. When he died in AD 395, the empire was split into the West Roman Empire and the East Roman Empire. Setting the stage for the decline of the Romans. The West Roman Empire came under a series of attacks by various Germanic tribes including the Vandals and the Visigoths, the western division of the Goths, who invaded Spain, Gaul, in western Europe, and northern Africa. These assaults eventually led to the disintegration of the West Roman Empire by 476. The East Roman Empire remained more or less intact, 
but it became known as the Byzantine Empire and was predominantly a Greek-oriented culture from 476 until 1453, when it fell to the Turks. When was the first solo non-stop transatlantic flight made? It was in 1927, on May 21st, at 10.24 p.m., American Charles A. Lindbergh, 1902-1974, landed his single-engine monoplane, the Spirit of St. Louis, at L.E. Bourget Airfield, Paris, after completing the first solo non-stop transatlantic flight. Lindbergh, declining to take a radio in order to save weight for an additional 90 gallons of gasoline, had taken off in the rain from Roosevelt Field, Long Island, New York. At 7.55 a.m. on May 20, the plane was so heavy with gasoline, a total of 451 gallons of it, that the spirit of St. Lewis had barely cleared telephone wires upon takeoff. Lindbergh covered 3,600 miles, about a third of it through snow and sleet, in 33 hours, 29 minutes. He won a $25,000 prize, which was offered in 1919, and became a world hero hailed as the Lone Eagle. His autobiography, titled The Spirit of S.T. Lewis, published 1953, won the Aviator the Pulitzer Prize. When did the exploration of space begin? The Space Age began on October 4, 1957, when the Soviet Union launched Sputnik. Later referred to as Sputnik 1, the first artificial satellite. The world reacted to the news of Sputnik. Which took pictures of the far side of the moon, with a mix of shock and respect. Premier Nikita Khrushchev, 1894-1971 Of the Soviet Union immediately approved funding for follow-up projects. And leaders in the West, not to be outdone by the Soviets in exploring the last frontier. Also vowed to support space programs. Four months later, the United States launched its first satellite. Explorer 1, on January 31, 1958. Not only had the launch of Sputnik initiated the space age, it had also started a space race, the Soviet and American programs would continue to rival each other. With one accomplishment leapfrogging the other, for about the next three decades. Who was the first person in space? The first person in space was Soviet cosmonaut Yuri A. Gagarin, 1934-1968, who orbited the Earth in the spaceship Vostok 1, launched April 12. 1961 the flight lasted 1 hour and 48 minutes. The achievement made Gagarin an international hero. U.S. President John F. Kennedy 1917-1963, to 
announced later that year, on November 25th. That the United States would land a man on the moon before the end of the decade. The first step toward reaching that goal was made by putting the first American into space. On May 5, 1961, Alan Shepard Jr., 1923 to 1998, piloted the first U.S. space flight. Aboard the Freedom 7, the suborbital flight reached an altitude of 116.5 miles. Just more than nine months later, the United States put a man into orbit. On February 20, 1962, astronaut John Glenn Jr. 1921, orbited Earth three times in the spaceship Friendship 7. Who said Veni, Vidi, Vici, and what does it mean? The famous words were written by Roman statesman and general Julius Caesar, 100-44b. C. As he announced the victory of his army in Asia Minor in early August 47 BC. The extraordinarily concise message. Which Caesar dispatched to Rome, means simply I came, I saw, I conquered. The general had defeated Pharnaces II, 63 to 47 BC. In a fight for control of Pontus, an ancient kingdom in northeast Asia Minor. The brief but decisive battle took place near Zella, in present-day Turkey. When did Marco Polo travel to the Far East? Marco Polo, 1254-1324, was only in his teens when he left Venice in about 1270 with his father. Niccolo, and his uncle Mafio, traveling an overland route to the east. The Polo brothers had made such a trip once before in 1260 they had traveled as far as Beijing, China. But upon their return home, they learned that Niccolo's wife, Marco Polo's mother, had died. So when the pair of adventurers set out again, they took the young Marco Polo with them. The Polos traveled from Acre, Israel, to Shavaz, Turkey, then through Mosul and Baghdad, in Iraq, to Ormuz. A bustling trade center on the Persian Gulf, where they intended to take a ship for the east. Seeing the ships, the travelers determined they weren't reliable transport, so they opted to continue on land. Heading north to Khorasan, in Iran, through Afghanistan, and to the Pamirs, a high plateau range in Central Asia. It took the Polos 40 days to transverse the high altitude range. Finally reaching the garden city of Kashgar, China. From there, the Polos followed a path skirting the Taklamakan Desert and then rested before crossing the Goba Desert which they did in 30 days' time, covering some 300 miles. Stopping in Tunhuang, the center of Buddhism in China, the European travelers then followed a southeast path that would have paralleled the Great Wall, constructed in the 3rd century BC. After following the Yellow, Huanghe, River, the Polos were met by emissaries of Kublai Khan, 1215-1294.
they continued with their guides on a 40-day trip to Xanadu, Shangtu, China, 300 miles north of Beijing. Where they were received by Kublai Khan himself, founder and ruler of the Mongol dynasty and grandson of Genghis Khan. C. 1162-1227 It was May 1275. Kublai Khan, who was an ardent Buddhist and a patron of the arts, took a liking to the young Marco Polo, who entered into diplomatic service for the ruler. In that capacity Marco Polo traveled to India and visited the kingdom of Kampa. What is now Vietnam, Thailand, the Malay Peninsula, Sumatra, Sri Lanka and India. The Polos, European courtiers who were well liked by the great Khan. Stayed in China until 1292, finally returning home by way of Sumatra, India and Persia present-day Iran. In 1295 they arrived back in Venice, which they found at war with longtime rival Genoa. The Polos carried with them many riches, including ivory, jade, jewels, porcelain, and silk. Marco Polo was now a man in his forties and had spent most of his life thus far in the Far East. Who was the first person to reach the South Pole? Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen, 1872-1928, was first to reach the South Pole, in December 1911. Before earning this distinction, he had achieved another first sailing the Northwest Passage, from 1903 to 1906. Amundsen's desire to be an Arctic explorer had been with him almost his entire life. As a teen, he is said to have slept with his bedroom windows. Open year-round in order to become accustomed to the cold. When he was a young man of 21. He turned his attention away from the study of medicine to making an Arctic passage. He recognized that many of the previous, and failed, attempts to travel to the Arctic shared a common characteristic. The commanders of these expeditions had not always been ship's captains. He resolved to become an experienced navigator and soon took jobs as a deckhand on various ships. In 1897 Amundsen was chosen as the first mate on the Belgica. The ship that would carry the first Belgian Antarctic expedition under the command of Adrian Gerlake de Gomery. 1866-1934, also on board was the American Dr. Frederick Cook, 1865-1940, who had been on one of Robert E. Peary's, 1856 to 1920, earlier Arctic expeditions and who would, in 1909, dispute Peary's claim that he was the first to reach the North Pole. This was the same news that Amundsen would hear as he was preparing to make the North Pole. Upon learning of the success of Peary's 1909 expedition, Amundsen shifted his sights to reaching the South Pole instead, and quietly began to lay plans to do so. In fact, it was not until his expedition, which left Oslo in September 1910, was underway that he telegraphed his announcement back to Norway that he was in fact headed to the South, not the North, Pole. As it turned out, a race was on between the Norwegians and the British. Shortly after Amundsen had set sail, 
Naval Officer Robert Falcon Scott, 1868-1912 Had left England at the head of an expedition to reach the South Pole. The Norwegians landed at Ross Ice Shelf, Antarctica, on February 10, 1911. It was not until 10 months later. On December 14, 1911, on a sunny afternoon, that they raised their country's flag at the spot their calculations told them was the South Pole. Before heading north again, they celebrated their achievement with double rations. When British naval officer Robert Falcon Scott's expedition arrived at the South, Pole on the morning of January 18, 1912, they found the Norwegian flag flying over it. On their way back the crew died due to bad weather and insufficient food supplies. Amundsen's Norwegian expedition arrived safely at their base camp on January 25, 1912. What is the Protestant ethic? The Protestant ethic is a term describing a set of attitudes fostered by the leaders of the Reformation. Martin Luther, 1483-1546, John Calvin, 1509-1564, John Knox, 1513-1572, Huldrych Zwingli, 1484-1531, Conrad Grebel, c. 1498-1526, and their Protestant successors such as Methodist Church founders John Wesley. 1703-1791, and Charles Wesley, 1707-1788. These church leaders stressed the holiness of a person's daily life, the importance of pastors to lead family lives, versus the celibacy of Catholic monks and nuns, education and study, and personal responsibility. According to these beliefs, the person who is hardworking, thrifty, and honest is a good person of value to their community and to God. From 1904 to 1905, German sociologist Max Weber, 1864 to 1920, wrote an essay called The Protestant Ethic and the Spirit of Capitalism, asserting that Protestant principles contributed to the growth of industry and commerce during the 1700s and 1800s since the hard work investment and savings of individuals help build a capitalist economy. Why was John Paul II called the People's Pope? Because during his 27-year tenure, he dramatically changed the public perception of the Pope. Polish Cardinal Karol Wojtyla, 1920-2005, was named Pope John Paul II on October 16, 1978. Becoming the first non-Italian head of the Roman Catholic Church in 455 years. From the first moments of his service, it was clear that this was a different kind of Pope. Upon his election, he greeted the cardinals of the conclave his brothers standing rather than seated, which was the tradition. A few weeks after his election, 
he leaned out the windows of the Vatican Palace to sing carols with 50,000 children gathered in St. Peter's Square to celebrate Christmas. Instead of limiting his concerns to the administration of the church, he traveled far and wide to carry the message of Christianity to the people. Crowds, often numbering in the hundreds of thousands to millions, gathered to see him around the globe. In 1979 he made his first trip to the United States. After which Time magazine ran a cover story with the headline, John Paul, Superstar. Pope John Paul fought for freedom of religion everywhere, even challenging his communist homeland. His call for solidarity contributed to the downfall of communism in Poland and across the Eastern Bloc. He published regularly memoirs as well as books of prayers, lessons, meditations, and poetry. Despite his active ministry on the world stage, he remained a traditionalist. Never wavering from the ages old teachings of the Catholic Church. When he died on April 2, 2005, he was hailed both as a holy man and a man of peace by Christians and non Christians alike. Who was Tamerlane? Tamerlane, 1336-1405, was a Central Asian conqueror who gained power in the late 1300s. His Islamic name was Timur, Tamerlane is the English version. He was a barbaric warrior and a brilliant military leader whose fearsome tactics earned him the name Tamerlane the Terrible. By 1370 he was a powerful warlord whose government was centered in the province of Samarkand. In present-day Uzbekistan. In 1383 he launched a series of conquests that lasted more than 20 years and gained him control of a vast region including Iraq. Armenia, Mesopotamia, Georgia, Russia, and parts of India. He died in 1405, on an expedition to conquer China. His body was entombed in an elaborate mausoleum, which is considered a treasure of Islamic art. After his death, his sons and grandsons fought for control of his dynasty, which remained intact for another hundred years. Tamerlane and his heirs built Samarkand into a great city. In its day it was a center for culture and scholarship in Central Asia. When did people first migrate to the Western Hemisphere? from Europe's discovery of the American Indian at the end of the 15th century to the present. The questions of who the Native American populations are and how they came to the Western Hemisphere. North and South America and the surrounding waters, have intrigued scholars, clergymen, and laymen. The advancement of anthropology has yielded some answers. Since no skeletal remains of a human physical type earlier than Homo sapiens have yet been found in the Americas. Researchers have concluded that the continents were settled through migration. Many scholars believe that Asians came to America during two periods, the first, between 50,000 and 40,000 BC. 
and the second, between 26,000 and 8,000 BC. They are believed to have come by way of a great land or ice bridge. Beringia, over the Bering Strait, between Asia, Russia, and North America, Alaska. This causeway was covered by water from about 40,000 to 26,000 BC because of a period of melting. Which would have prevented passage. Most scholars also agree that there were several discrete and perhaps isolated movements of various peoples from Asia to the Americas. The migrations might have been prompted by population increases in the tribes of Central Asia, which impelled some to move eastward in quest of food sources animals. As game moved across the Bering Strait, Hunters followed. Over time, population growth caused early men to continue southward through the Americas. So that by 8000 BC there were primitive hunters even in Tierra del Fuego. Which forms the southernmost part of South America. Around 5000 BC the disappearance of large game. Animals in both North and South America produced a series of regional developments. Culminating in the emergence of several great civilizations, including the Inca, Maya, and Aztec. Will Mother Teresa be sainted? As of the early 2000s Mother Teresa of Calcutta was on the road to sainthood. On October 19, 2003, she was beatified. A key step in the process that began just two years after her death. Her worldwide reputation of holiness prompted Pope John Paul II, 1920-2005. To waive the customary five year waiting period for the cause of canonization to begin. Mother Teresa's heroic virtues, a requirement for sainthood, were well known long before she died. The modern martyr spent nearly 70 years working as a missionary among the poor. The last 50 of them in outreach to society's most downtrodden, the impoverished, sick, and dying. She lived modestly, dressed simply, usually in a plain white sari, which she felt identified her with the poor. And devoted herself wholly to helping those society had forgotten. The so-called Saint of the Gutter received worldwide recognition for her work. In 1979 she was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Though she came into contact with some of the world's most influential people. She was unchanged by the attention. When the Pope gave her a Lincoln Continental for her own personal transportation. She auctioned it off to raise needed funds for her works of charity. Reportedly, when she visited Britain's Princess Diana, 1961 to 1997. The nun looked on the large rooms in the royal palace and uttered something to the effect of just think how many people could live in these rooms. Another requirement of sainthood is involvement in miracles. In October 2002 it was reported that Pope John Paul's office had attributed a miracle to Mother Teresa. A young Indian woman was cured of a stomach tumor after praying to her. The Vatican, however, found no scientific explanation for the woman's recovery. On December 20, 2002, 
the Pope approved the decrees of her heroic virtues and miracles. Paving the way for Mother Teresa's beatification in 2003. Her sainthood appeared to be imminent. Were the Vikings the first Europeans to reach North America? It is believed that the seafaring Norsemen, who are alternately called the Vikings, were in fact the first Europeans to see the Western Hemisphere, North and South America and the surrounding waters. Norwegian-born Leif Erikson, C970 C1020 is generally credited with having been the first European to set foot on North American soil. Erikson was the son of navigator Erik the Red, who founded a Norse settlement in Greenland and moved his family there in 985 or 986. About that same time another Norseman, Bjarni Herjolfsson, who was driven off course on his way from Iceland to Greenland, became the first European to sight North America, but he did not go ashore. It is believed that Ericsson decided he would follow up on Herjolfsson's discovery. About 1001 Ericsson set out from Greenland with a crew of 35 men and probably landed on the southern end of Baffin Island, due north of the province of Quebec. The expedition likely made it to Labrador, Newfoundland, on the northeastern North American mainland, and later landed on the coast of what is today Nova Scotia or Newfoundland. Canada, this landfall may have been at Lance Auxiliary Meadows, on Newfoundland Island. Ericsson and his crew spent the winter of 1001-02 at a place he called Vinland, which was described as well-wooded and produced fruit, especially grapes. He returned to Greenland in the spring of 1002, the first authenticated European. Landing in North America was in 1500 when Portuguese navigator Gaspar de Corte Real C1450 C1501 explored the coast of Labrador and Newfoundland. A year later, he made a second trip to North America but never returned home. In 1502 his brother Miguel went out in search of him, neither returned. What did immigrants experience at Ellis Island? The Ellis Island Immigration Depot was a processing center for third-class ship passengers arriving in New York Harbor. Most first- and second-class passengers were processed by immigration officials on board their ships. The new arrivals were ferried from their transatlantic vessels to Ellis Island, where they disembarked and were guided in groups into registration areas in the Great Hall, a room 200 feet long and 100 feet wide. There they were questioned by government officials who determined their eligibility to land. Upon completing the registration process, newcomers were ushered into rooms where they were examined by doctors. The processing was extremely businesslike to the point of being dehumanizing. Processing typically took between three and five hours. An estimated 98% of those arriving at Ellis Island were allowed into the country. 
the remaining 2% were turned back for medical reasons. As U.S. health officials tried to keep out infectious diseases, or for reasons of insanity or criminal record. Other Facilities at the Ellis Island Immigration Station included showers that could accommodate as many as 8,000 bathers a day. Restaurants, railroad ticket offices, a laundry, and a hospital. At its peak, the Ellis Island Station processed some 5,000 immigrants and non-immigrating aliens, visitors, daily. Who was Genghis Khan? He was a Mongol conqueror who rose to power in the early 13th century. To rule over one of the greatest continental empires the world has seen. Born to Mujin, c. 1167 to 1227, he was named Genghis Khan, meaning universal ruler. In 1206, he was a fearless military leader, a brilliant strategist, and a ruthless subjugator, known for his brutal methods. Timujin was the firstborn son of the leader of a small nomadic clan. When he was a young boy, his father was killed by a neighboring tribe. Totters, and thus he rose to the status of chief. But instead of allowing a boy to lead them, clan members abandoned Timujin and his family. He survived the hard-scrabbled youth of a destitute nomad. But by all accounts, he seemed destined to become a great leader. By the time he was 20 years old, Timujin had managed to forge alliances with various tribal leaders and claimed the leadership of a small clan. By 1189 he united two Mongol tribes, which he organized to conquer the rival. Totters by the year 1202. At a conference of Mongol leaders in 1206, Timujin was pronounced the great ruler. Or Genghis Khan, of the unified Mongolian state. He began a transformation of the Mongol tribes. Dividing them into military units, each one supported by a number of households. He imposed law and order, promoted education, and stimulated economic prosperity. Within five years, Mongol society was changed from a nomadic tribal to a military feudal system. Thus organized, Genghis Khan prepared his troops to expand the Mongolian Empire. Genghis Khan's armies embarked on a series of military campaigns. Claiming land and subjugating people sometimes using barbaric methods. By 1213 he controlled northern China to the Great Wall. By 1219 he controlled most of China and began campaigns into the Muslim world. When he died in the field in 1227, Genghis Khan commanded the vast territory from China to the Caspian Sea. He was succeeded by his sons, who continued to expand the Mongol holdings. His grandson was Kublai Khan, 1215 to 1294, under whose leadership the Mongolian Empire reached its pinnacle. Was Attila the Hun really a savage? While Attila, c. 
406 to 453, may have possessed some of the worthwhile qualities of a military leader. The king of the Huns was no doubt a ruthless and fierce figure. He is believed to have ascended through the ranks of the Hun army. Coming to power as the leader of the nomadic group in 434. By this time, the Huns, who originated in Central Asia, had occupied the Volga River Valley in the area of present-day Western Russia. At first, like his predecessors, he was wholly occupied with fighting other barbarian tribes for control of lands. But under Attila's leadership, the Huns began to extend their power into Central Europe. He waged battles with the Eastern Roman armies, and after murdering his older brother and co-ruler Bilda in 445, went on to trample the countries of the Balkan Peninsula and northern Greece causing terrible destruction along the way. As Attila continued westward with his bloody campaigns, which each Hun fought using his own weapons and his own savage technique, he nearly destroyed the foundations of Christianity. But the combined armies of the Romans and the Visigoths defeated Attila and the Huns at Chalons. In northeastern France, in June 451, which is known as one of the most decisive battles of all time. From there, Attila and his men moved into Italy, devastating the countryside before Pope Leo I, c. 400-461, succeeded in persuading the brutal leader to spare Rome. For this and other reasons, Leo was later canonized, becoming Saint Leo. Attila died suddenly and of natural causes in 453. Just as he was again preparing to cross the Alps and invade Italy anew. What was the Great Awakening? The Great Awakening was an American religious movement that began in New England in the mid-1730s. At its center were the fire and brimstone sermons delivered by charismatic preachers such as Congregational Minister Jonathan Edwards, 1703-1758, and Anglican Missionary George Whitefield, 1714-1770. Revivals were another cornerstone of the movement, these were evangelistic meetings that moved around the countryside. From Maine to Georgia, converting, or awakening. People to Christianity not through the doctrines of the church, but rather through the individual's own experience. The theology of the Great Awakening was Calvinist, stressing the depravity of man and the Sovereignty of God and promoting the belief that faith, and not conduct, is the road to salvation. In its emphasis on the individual and its espousal that the individual is the final arbiter of truth. The movement had a profound effect on the spiritual and political character of what would soon become the United States. Since many vehemently opposed the movement, it also served to divide churches between the revivalists and the traditionalists. Thus, it diversified American religious life and promoted religious tolerance. Who was the first to reach Mount Everest's summit?
New Zealander Sir Edmund Hillary, 1919. Was the first person to climb to the summit of Mount Everest, the highest mountain in the world. Everest, in the Himalaya Mountains, between Nepal and Tibet. Rises nearly five and a half miles, 29,028 feet, above sea level. After numerous climbers made attempts on Everest between 1921 and 1952. Hillary reached the top on May 29, 1953, as part of a British-led expedition. He was followed by fellow climber Tenzing Norgay, 1914-1986, a Nepalese Sherpa. Hillary took a picture of Tenzing at the summit. But Tenzing did not know how to work the camera so there is no picture of Hillary. The Sir was added to Hillary's name by Queen Elizabeth II, 1926. Who took great pleasure in the fact that the triumph on Everest had been achieved by a British expedition. Having been crowned on June 2, 1953, it was one of her first official acts as Queen. The mountain was named for another Briton, Sir George Everest. 1790 to 1866 who served as a british surveyor general of india from 1830 to 1843 tibetans call the mountain komaluma and the nepalese call it sagarmatha What was the impact of the Hundred Years' War? After waging war with each other for more than a century. In 1453, both England and France emerged as stronger, centralized governments. As the governments had gained strength, the nobility in both countries found themselves with less power and influence than they had enjoyed previously, and the system of feudalism, which before the war had been necessary in the absence of a larger, protective entity, was on the decline. In their strategies against each other, both countries had developed new military tactics. And though England had fewer resources than did France, it still managed to assert itself at sea, marking the beginning of that country's naval prowess. Who was Eleanor of Aquitaine? Eleanor of Aquitaine, c. 1122-1204, was among the most powerful figures of the Middle Ages, 500-1350. Her father was William X, 1099-1137, the Duke of Aquitaine one of the largest and wealthiest regions that became modern France. It extended from the Loire River to the Pyrenees Mountains. Eleanor inherited her father's vast holdings when he died in 1137, she was a teenager at the time. The same year, she married Louis VII, c. 1120 1180, who, within a month, succeeded his father as the King of France. As queen, Eleanor took an active role in her husband's business, even accompanying him on the Second Crusade. 1147-49, 
purportedly so that she and her numerous female attendants could care for the wounded. The expedition ended in failure. Largely because of a disagreement between the king and queen about the objective. Thereafter women were prohibited from joining the crusades. Though Eleanor and Louis had two children, both daughters. They were granted an annulment of their unhappy marriage in 1152 on the grounds that they were distantly related. According to feudal law, Eleanor regained Aquitaine. Within a year she married again, to Henry Plantagenet. 1133-1189, of England, who was some ten years her junior. In 1154 he became King Henry II, and Eleanor was again queen, this time of England. Though the couple had eight children, five sons and three daughters, their marriage was stormy. Henry had liaisons with other women, the result of which was an illegitimate line of heirs to the throne. Eleanor also resented him for his attempts to control Aquitaine, which she felt was rightly hers. In 1173, when Henry and Eleanor's three surviving sons attempted to depose their father. Eleanor threw her support behind her sons. The rebellion failed, and Eleanor fled for France. In 1174 she was captured and returned to England, where she was put in semi-confinement by her husband. The king, until his death in 1189. Henry died while attempting to put down another rebellion by his sons. Richard the Lionhearted 1157-1199 and John Lackland 1167-1216. After King Henry's death, Eleanor again became a powerful force in European politics. Her son, Richard the Lionhearted, inherited the English throne. And she took an active role in his administration. She even stepped in for him when he left England to fight in the Crusades. When Richard died in 1199, his brother John ascended the throne. Eleanor, then in her late 70s, continued to wield power and influence. In an effort to ensure the future of the Plantagenets and to reconcile the English and French aristocracies. She arranged for one of her granddaughters to marry the son of the French king. She also managed to secure the family's land holdings in France for King John. She retired from her active political life in 1202 and died two years later. What was the Hundred Years' War? The term refers to a succession of wars between England and France. The fighting began in 1337 and did not end until 1453. However, the period was not one of constant warfare. Truces and treaties brought about breaks in the military action between the countries. The reasons for the conflicts were many, England was trying to hang on to its provinces on the European continent. The French threw their support behind the Scots, who had their own battles with the English. The French wished to control the commercial centre of Flanders, present-day Belgium where the English had set up a profitable wool trade, and finally. The two countries disagreed about who should control the English Channel, the body of water that lies between them. 
to further complicate matters, marriages between the English and French aristocracy. Meant that heirs to either throne could find themselves with a foreign relative. Allowing them to lay claim to authority over the other country as well. When the first war broke out in 1337, King Edward III, 1312-1377, of England claimed the French throne on the basis of the fact that his mother, Isabella, was the daughter of France's King Philip IV. Called Philip the Fair, 1268-1314, and the sister of three French kings. Over the course of the next century, even though England won most of the battles and for a brief time controlled France. 1420-22, it was the French who ultimately won the war in 1453. England lost all its territory on the continent. Except Calais, which was also later taken by the French, in 1558. How did Joan of Arc become a warrior? Joan of Arc, called the Maid of Orleans, c. 1412-1431, gained fame for leading the French into victory over the English in the battle for Orleans in 1429. A year before the battle. The English forces had invaded northern France and took possession of an area that included the city of Reims, where all of France's kings were crowned in the cathedral. Thus, Charles VII, 1403-1461, whom France recognized as their king, had never had a proper coronation. It is said that Joan, an extraordinarily devoted Catholic who was then just a teen. Appealed to Charles to allow her to go into battle against the English who were besieging Orleans. Though he was skeptical of her at first. She claimed to have heard the voices of saints, he eventually conceded. In the battlefield, Joan also overcame the doubts of the French troops and their leaders. Who were understandably hesitant to follow the young girl's lead. She proved to them that she was not only capable but also successful. In April 1429, in just ten days' time, Joan led the French to victory over the English, who fled Orleans. Still determined to see Charles properly crowned, Joan proceeded to lead a military escort for the king into Reims. Where he was at last coronate on July 17, 1429 with Joan of Arc standing beside him. Next she determined that Charles should authorize her to try to free Paris from English control. Again the king acquiesced, but this time with dire results, she was captured by the French Burgundians. English sympathizers and loyalists, who turned her over to the English. Believing she was a heretic, by all reports Joan of Arc was clairvoyant, the English burned her at the stake in Rouen. France, on May 30, 1431. She is still considered a national hero of France. Recognizing Joan of Arc for her unswerving faith and for having valiantly pursued what she believed her mission to be. The Catholic Church canonized Joan of Arc in 1920. The feast day of St. Joan of Arc is celebrated on May 30th.
What was the Norman Conquest? The Norman Conquest is the brief but critical period in British history that began when the French Duke William of Normandy, c. 1028-1087, sailed across the English Channel in 1066 and invaded England. This was upon the death of what would turn out to be England's last Anglo-Saxon king. Edward the Confessor, c. 1003-1066, while William became known as William the Conqueror. And he did conduct a brutal conquest of Anglo-Saxon England, he might have had reason to believe. He could claim the English throne upon King Edward's death, the named successor, Harold, c. 1022-1066, of the powerful Wessex family, had two years earlier become shipwrecked off the coast of France. Where he reportedly took an oath that he would, upon King Edward's death, support William of Normandy, who was King Edward's distant cousin, as heir. Hearing of Edward's death, William and his army set sail for England where Harold had already assumed the throne as King Harold II. But Harold had previously quarreled with his brother Tostig. And the noble Wessex family was divided and engaged in a power struggle. Tostig was joined in his fight by the Norwegians who, at the same time that William was landing on England's southern coast, invaded from the north. Thus, William and his troops entered England without opposition. Since Harold was focusing his efforts elsewhere, though the king defeated the Norwegians and Tostig, who was slain in battle, he would not emerge the victor in his subsequent battle with William. On October 14 the two met in battle at Hastings, near the entrance to the Strait of Dover. Though he fought valiantly, Harold was killed. William was crowned at Westminster Abbey on Christmas Day 1066. Within a few years. By 1070, he had killed many Anglo-Saxon nobles and the rest he deprived of their land. In the 21 years of his reign, William imposed Norman aristocracy on England. Required that French be spoken at court, and drew England closer to Europe. He ruled until his death in 1087. After which the Norman nobility mixed with what was left of the Anglo-Saxons. It is this intermingling that produced the English language from the German tongue of the Anglo-Saxons combined with the Norman French. William's descendants, albeit distantly so, have ruled England ever since his takeover in 1066. How many immigrants arrived at Ellis Island? More than 12 million people first entered the United States through Ellis Island. Their descendants account for an estimated 40% of the nation's current population. The majority of new arrivals were European, but immigrants also came from the West Indies, Asia, and the Middle East. More men than women arrived at the immigration depot. Originally a three-acre landmass, the island is situated in the New York Harbor. 
off the southern tip of Manhattan. It was named for Samuel Ellis, a merchant and farmer who owned the island during the late 1700s. New York acquired the land, and in 1808 sold it to the federal government. The site served as a fort, and later, an arsenal. By the end of the century, record numbers of immigrants prompted the federal government to establish a bureau to process the new arrivals. The vast majority of whom entered the country at its largest port, New York City. On January 1, 1892, the federal immigration station opened on the island in the shadows of the Statue of Liberty, dedicated 1886 on nearby Bedloe Island. The Ellis Island facility, which by 1901 consisted of 35 buildings, was the country's chief immigration station. Its heaviest use was in processing the influx of immigrants who arrived between 1892 and 1924 the facility was closed on November 29, 1954, when immigration quotas had drastically reduced the number of incoming people and the mass processing center was no longer needed. On May 11, 1965, Ellis Island was designated a National Historic Site. During the 1980s it was extensively restored so that visitors to the park and museum are afforded a glimpse of what their ancestors experienced upon arriving in this new land. When was Amelia Earhart last heard from? American aviator Amelia Earhart, 1897-1937, the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean, was last seen on July 1, 1937, and was last heard from on July 2, as she and navigator Fred Noonan. 1893-1937, attempted to make an around-the-world flight along the equator. The Kansas-born Earhart first became interested in aviation, which was very new at the time, during the early 1920s and began taking flying lessons. In 1928 she was invited to be the only woman on board a transatlantic flight, which departed from Newfoundland and landed in Wales. The trip made her famous as the first woman to cross the Atlantic Ocean by air. She followed that accomplishment in 1932 with a solo transatlantic flight, Earhart took off from Harbour Grace, Newfoundland, Canada, on the evening of May 20, 1932. Her destination was Paris. Within hours problems began for the aviator, she encountered a violent electrical storm. The altimeter failed, the wings iced up, and finally, the exhaust manifold caught on fire. Earhart decided to land in Ireland rather than attempting Paris. After a 15-hour flight, she touched down in a pasture outside of Londonderry in Northern Ireland. Again, fame and acclaim were hers, as the first woman to cross the Atlantic in a solo flight. She went on to set speed and distance records for aviation and soon conceived of the idea of flying around the world along the equator. On May 20, 1937, Earhart and Noonan took off from Oakland, California. 
reaching Miami, Florida, they stopped for repairs. On June 1, 1937, they departed Miami and headed for Brazil. From there, they flew across the Atlantic to Africa and then across the Red Sea to the Arabian Peninsula. Then it was on to Karachi, Pakistan, Calcutta, India and Burma, present-day Myanmar. Earhart reached New Guinea on June 30, and she and Noonan prepared for the most difficult leg of the journey, to Howland Island. A tiny speck of land only two and a half miles long in the middle of the vast Pacific Ocean. The next day, July 1st, they left New Guinea and began the 2,600-mile flight to Howland Island. On July to a U.S. Navy vessel picked up radio messages from Earhart that indicated reports of empty fuel tanks. Efforts to make radio contact with her failed. Though an extensive search effort ensued. No trace of the plane or two-person crew was found, and no one knows for certain what happened. Speculation surrounds the disappearance. One theory was that Earhart's true mission in making the around the world flight was to spy on the Japanese occupied Pacific Islands. However, this has never been substantiated, and, given the circumstances under which they were flying, the likelihood is that the plane crashed into the ocean, claiming Earhart's and Noonan's lives. Who was the first man to walk on the moon? It was American astronaut Neil Armstrong, 1930, who, on July 20, 1969, stepped out of the lunar module from Apollo 11 and walked on the moon. Armstrong, who was joined by astronaut Edwin Buzz Aldrin Jr. 1930, uttered the famous words, that's one small step for a man, one giant leap for mankind. The live voice transmission had dropped the A before man, but it was added in later. How did the earliest peoples arrive in North America? Long before the arrival of the Europeans in the Western Hemisphere in the late 1400s and early 1500s, Asian peoples are believed to have migrated over Beringia a land bridge that is thought to have existed over the Bering Strait. The waterway that separates Asia, Russia, from North America, Alaska. Scholars believe that during the late Ice Age, known as the Pleistocene Glacial Epoch, which ended about 10,000 BC, a natural bridge was formed across the strait either by ice or by dropping sea levels that exposed land masses. Asian peoples, who were hunters, are believed to have migrated over Beringia as they pursued large game. Arriving in North America as early as 50,000 BC, these people, called Paleo Indians, were the first inhabitants of the Western Hemisphere. After their arrival, they spread out across North and South America. The many American Indian groups that were encountered by the Europeans upon their arrival were descendants of the migratory Paleo Indians.
Are the adventures of Marco Polo true? Most of the tales are accepted as true and accurate by modern scholars. It is only those accounts that deal with places where it is not known that Marco Polo traveled. Such as Africa, that are seen as legend rather than fact. Upon his return to Venice in 1295, Marco Polo, 1254-1324, took up the family occupation and worked as a merchant. Three years later, he was on board a ship that was captured by a rival Genos ship. He was subsequently imprisoned in the port city of Genoa, where he met a writer named Rustic Hello, or Rusticiano, from the Italian city of Pisa. Polo recounted his stories to Rustic Hello, who wrote them down and published them as the Divisament do Monde, Description of the World. The book was an immediate popular success and became one of the most important sources of Western knowledge of the East. Readers today know the stories as the travels of Marco Polo. How is someone sainted? Criteria for sainthood, also called canonization, are leading a holy life, conducting miracles, and suffering or even dying because of one's faith, martyrdom. The Catholic Church keeps a list of saints from which certain names were dropped in 1969 since their inclusion could not be justified by history. <laughs>